Okay, hi, this is uh, Mike Krenke with the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative in Cloquet. And this is the sixth uh, webinar that we have in the series brought to you by the University of Minnesota Northeast Sustainable Development Partnership and the SFEC. Welcome, and I'm going to go through a few logistics and introduce Tony, and then Tony will be speaking for about an hour. And then we have a little poll at the end of uh, Tony's presentation. Uh, we want to ask you a few questions. So if you look at your screen, uh, Tony will be presenting uh, the PowerPoint presentation. He'll be talking. If you happen to have any questions, uh, on the left side of your screen is a little chat pod. I'd like you to enter your question you might have, and then I'll help to monitor, and then Tony will be answering those questions as we go along. Uh, and then I also would like to have all the people that are online uh, to type in their names so that we have record that you've actually attended. You'll be receiving one credit, uh, continuing education, forestry education credit, with the SAF and also with the Minnesota uh, Forest Stewardship. So just to alert you, uh, uh, Lisa Brewer in our office uh, is tracking the credits for Andrew Ahrens and Gary Michaels with the DNR. And uh, I was just trained to also grade classes. So I'm grading classes right now. So uh, myself and Larry Westerberg will be doing that uh, for the state of Minnesota. So um, I'm going to start the webinar. And uh, Tony D'Amato's talk will focus on some of the current ways in which silviculture is being applied within North American forests to meet a diversity of objectives, ranging from bioenergy production and carbon sequestration to the restoration of ecological complexity. In addition, the potential role of silviculture in maintaining resiliency in the face of future global change will be discussed. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Tony Tomato. Tony? Uh, thanks, Mike, and uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, starting off their, their Monday with this webinar. Uh, as Mike mentioned, today really what I'm hoping to do, I'm um, certainly not uh, Nostradamus and can't give you a prediction of what civil culture will be throughout the 21st century, but uh, my goal for today is really to highlight what some of the kind of main movements are in civil culture um, to address some of the items like conservation of biodiversity and um, global change that Mike alluded to. And so really using um, some examples of, of how we might be doing that and, and how we might move forward over the next um, 10, 15 years or so um, with, with these different paradigms. And so for today's we webinar, I'm basically just going to give you a brief context for um, where these current civil cultural practices are, are coming from and, and discuss how those current global issues are really forced us or, or have caused a kind of repackaging of how we approach civil culture in response to some of these emerging objectives and emerging concerns. Um, I'll then just focus in on, on two main um, kind of paradigms that we've been seeing emerge in response to these changes, ecological civil culture and um, civil culture aimed at, at, at addressing carbon and climate change objectives, and then finish by discussing what are some of the trade-offs that involve um, one objective versus the other, and, and how do we deal with um, kind of this constantly changing uh, future. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just the current context, and, and most everybody has is, is heard this ad nauseum, but um, as we think about you know, managing forests and, and using civil culture, um, we're, we're really faced with a very uncertain future. Um, we know that things are changing. Um, whether we want to uh, describe a certain cause for that change is, is, is beyond this discussion, but we certainly are seeing um, you know, increased variation in climatic patterns, um, shifts in disturbance regimes, in some cases towards much more extreme disturbances than we would have seen in historical times. Um, we definitely are seeing an increase in invasive species, um, both in the context of invasive plants, such as pictured in the, the center picture is uh, garlic mustard um, invading an oak stand, but also um, even more um, importantly, seeing invasive insects and diseases that have the potential to um, wipe out large portions of the forested land base. Um, here in the Lake States, and I, I recognize that we have folks from Minnesota, um, as well as Wisconsin, and even someone from Manitoba, but collectively, in many parts of the lake states and, and, and throughout um, North America, we're seeing increasing herbivore populations, um, certainly deer here in the lake states, but in some parts of the, the world, increasing elk and, 
um, moose populations are also influencing you know, how we do things. Along the same lines, we're also really concerned at a global scale with decreases in native biodiversity. Um, some folks might be familiar with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report that was done in the early 2000s that really looked at um, how sustainable are our ecosystem services around the world. And what they found was the critical role biodiversity plays in sustaining things like you know, clean water, carbon sequestration, and that in general, many of our native biota were, were on decline. And so there's certainly um, that, that emerging concern that we face on a daily basis when we're, we're being told to manage our forests. Beyond kind of the biological issues that are in, in kind of physical issues that are occurring, we also have a kind of an emerging context that is very different than what we dealt with even 20 years ago in managing forest lands. Certainly, ownership patterns are changing dramatically. Um, we're really shifting away from um, industrial ownerships to, to ownerships that are either based on kind of the real estate investment trust model or, or timber investment management organization models and our, our more um, historic forest industry lands. Um, our public lands are seeing a lot more scrutiny in terms of um, balancing objectives with, with timber and, and wildlife and, and, and aesthetics. And we're also seeing just a, a general parcelization of the landscape in response to just changing ownership patterns, continued fragmentation of a lot of these um, larger private blocks into to smaller lots, which, which certainly complicates what we do. And then finally, even though we're dealing with kind of a collective um, decline in, in traditional forest product markets, um, there's certainly a lot of talk and, and momentum starting to build behind other op opportunities for marketing wood products, things like bioenergy, as well as carbon trade. That I'll allude to later in the talk in terms of, of where that might fit into things. And so we certainly have a, a rapidly changing landscape. And, and unfortunately, a lot of that, that change is, is causing us to feel even more uncertain about, about where we're going. And so in response to a lot of these changes, and, and, and often it's really in response to kind of societal expectations and, and pressures regarding um, what they want from our forests, we, we've kind of seen um, a major repackaging, as I, I'd say, of silviculture over the past 20 years or so. And so I'm going to focus on kind of three types of, of repackaging we, we've seen. And so we've, we've kind of gone from the good old days where we could um, you know, dress up and, in a nice suit and, and look at the red pine plantation grow to, to a much more complex suite of objectives that, that we're seeing. And, and kind of one of the, the first types of packaging I'm going to talk about today has been a repackaging of kind of our traditional multiple use sustained yield approach um, to forest management and civil culture towards what was originally coined as um, new forestry in the mid-'80s um, by, by folks in the Pacific Northwest and what I'll, I'll refer to more as ecological silviculture. And essentially, this paradigm shift really focused on trying to manage forests, both for wood products, but more importantly, for the conservation of native biodiversity. And so really, these, these approaches came about in response to those concerns about declines in biodiversity, and at, at the time, controversially around on things like the spotted owl and other issues in the Northwest. Um, basically, I'll get into detail about ecological civil culture, but essentially it's you know, managing forests with a main premise around trying to leave behind structures or, or creating patterns that, that sustain um, native biodiversity. A more recent emphasis that we've seen in terms of repackaging civil culture has been trying to use forest management and in civil culture in particular to enhance the amount of carbon that's being pulled from the atmosphere. Um, since we were in grade school, I think all of us were familiar with how plants and forests um, affected um, CO2 in the atmosphere through photosynthesis. But more recently, there's been um, market incentives, or at least a kind of a fledgling development of market incentives for managing forests for carbon storage. And so really, over the last five years, we've seen a huge explosion in how can we manage forests to take up and store more carbon. Kind of the, the last repackaging we've seen is, is, is much um, is probably the, is the most recent. And uh, some of you may have participated in this webinar by the author of the book that's pictured in the, the lower right-hand corner, uh, Klaus Putman. Um, a, a book came out uh, last year called A Critique of Civil Culture. And, and really what the book examined was how do we manage forests to be able to adapt to some of this uncertainty in the future? You know, how do we have systems that can be resilient to change? whether it be a large mountain pine beetle outbreak that you see in the lower right-hand corner or uncertainty in weather. And so this type of repackaging really has been shifting towards beyond managing for conserving biodiversity, we need to manage to have forests that are able to adapt and withstand future changes. So I'll be focusing on the, these three kind of repackaging 
as we go through through the talk. And, and as, as Mike alluded to, if anybody has questions at any time, feel free to type it in, and I'll be happy to address those. One thing that's important, um, you know, those, those that maybe logged on to hear the, the newest, latest, and greatest um, civil culture approaches that are being invented for the 21st century, um, I'd largely argue that um, in many cases the packaging is changing, so we're certainly rebranding things. We're, you know, we're, we're doing civil culture for carbon or civil culture for biodiversity, but the contents of those packages are largely the same. You know, thinning is still a thinning, regeneration harvest is still a regeneration harvest. It's really the approach and the philosophy that's different. And so the talk today really is going to focus largely on how do we use these existing tools to meet some of these emerging objectives? You know, and how do we think about some of these kind of existing practices in the context of global change and, and concerns about um, the native biodiversity? So I'm going to devote the first part of, of the talk to this discussing um, ecological civil culture, largely focusing just on the principles. I know we have a a wide range of, of forest types and geography represented in the, the participants. So I'm going to um, try my best not to get too Minnesota or certain ecosystem specific, although some of my examples will certainly draw from, from the landscapes of Minnesota. But just to reiterate, you know, ecological civil culture is, is kind of the oldest of the, of the new approaches to civil culture I'm going to talk about today. Um, e even though this was the rage you know, 10, 10 years ago, a lot of the, the goals of ecological civil culture are being superseded by things like managing for carbon and other, other attributes. But it's still one of the prevailing sentiments um, among the public. You know, ecological civil culture is the way they'd like to see many of um, our lands managed. And, and you'll see in a moment why, why that attitude uh, might, might prevail. So with ecological civil culture, really the, the overarching goal in a, of the, an objective of this management is that we are trying to maintain native biodiversity while at the same time extracting forest products. And so. Even though as I go through this, it'll seem like, um, you know, how, how do we even extract a piece of wood if we're going to be managing with all these other ecological objectives? It's important to, to realize there's a real gradient in intensity that you could apply this approach. And so um, it really revolves around what your economic and ecological objectives are for a given piece of land. And I'll, I'll get to um, how we might balance that at a landscape scale in a moment. But really the, the overarching philosophy behind ecological civil culture is that most of the species that are found in any given region, so our native species, have evolved under some historic disturbance regime. And basically what that disturbance regime does or has done, whether it's fires or fine scale gaps created by you know, insect outbreaks or, or, or root rot pockets, basically those disturbances have created a range of conditions across the landscape that have, that have served as habitat for those species. And so if our goal is to conserve native biodiversity, we should try to create and maintain some diversity of forest types and structures that emulate um, what we saw in the past. And, and what we would consider ecological civil culture in that context is that you know, if we're going to, on a landscape scale, try to maintain a diversity of habitat types, so maybe early successional jack pine, you know, late successional red pine, um, you know, mixed species, aspen, conifer, mixed wood stands, having this arranged across the landscape basically serves what we, is what we would call a coarse filter approach. That is. Instead of choosing a specific habitat type that we're managing for, that, that a single organism needs, we're going to focus on maintaining large patches of native vegetation that we know will at least serve as habitat for the majority of the species in the landscape. And so basically what we'd call a coarse filter approach. And, and really something that was developed by um, Malcolm Hunter, who some of you have read, read the, um, his early textbook on, on wildlife and, and forests. One of the underlying premises of ecological civil culture, and we'll, and we'll talk a bit about in a, towards the end as to, as to the validity of this premise as we get into kind of a, an uncertain future, is that one of the main um, ways in which we should go about making decisions, both of the stand and landscape scale, is to use our understanding of, of what has been the natural disturbance or historic disturbance patterns in a region, and to take information from that historic, historic disturbance regime, so things ranging from the severity of disturbance, the frequency of disturbance, what stands look like after the, those disturbances, and using those to kind of inform what we might see in the landscape. So an example of that might be, you know, historically we might have known that the center photo here, in certain portions of the landscape, we may have had mature red pine stands with the, with the second cohort beneath them. And so maybe in certain portions of the landscape, we might maintain, you know, two-age red pine stands in particularly areas of the landscape where we don't have risk from um, shoot blight disease. Likewise, getting an assessment of what some of these natural disturbances might have been done in terms of structure, 
might allow us to get a sense of, even after a standard placing disturbance, you know, what was the number of snags and standing dead trees that were left behind as legacies? And so as we develop our guidelines or do harvesting um, treatments, you know, what is, what is the level of wood we need to leave behind standing that would maybe emulate what would have been there after a natural disturbance? Likewise, thinking about just how frequent disturbance occurred in the landscape, things like rotation ages and cutting cycles, trying to, to base those on what we would have seen historically in terms of the frequency of natural disturbance and so forth. And so all of these decisions are, are made at the stand scale and then are, are, are blown out to the landscape scale when we start thinking about you know, how frequently disturbance might have, might have operated. So one of the main aspects that comes about dealing with natural disturbance-based regimes is that we're trying to figure out where does our portion of the landscape fit in in terms of what here historically with, with the frequency and severity of disturbance. And, and one way to think about that, it was put forth in a figure by, by Bob Seymour and others. This is from, from Maine, and I'm going to take a moment to go through this. I realize there's a series of lines on here. It's not jump out not always intuitive. Basically, on the y-axis, they have the, the area that was re is regenerated by a given disturbance, and on the x-axis, just the return intervals, so how frequently a disturbance occurred. And this ellipse over here is just representing how often uh, disturbance operated in the landscape that was large fires and wind. And so this is from Maine. Bear in mind, very different from um, places like Minnesota, Manitoba, or Wisconsin. And in Maine, basically, they didn't see large standard-replacing disturbances um, except maybe every 1,000 to 3,000 years. They often call that those forests up there in the northeast kind of the asbestos forests. Very, very rarely would burn. In contrast, when it comes to natural kind of canopy gaps from windstorms, basically they'd see a lot of those occurring very frequently in the landscape, but only affecting a very small area. And so based on this data, they kind of established this linear line right here. And everything to the right of this line falls within kind of the natural bounds of what they historically thought occurred. And so what they did was just plot well, if we took what it was normally an even age practice in, in Maine, which is a 20 hectare clear cut, so 50 acre clear cut, every 50 years, it actually exists well outside of this natural domain. And so if we really wanted to emulate the size of that disturbance, we would have to actually do a clear cut every 357 years to put it more in line with what was naturally occurring. So this is kind of one approach. Obviously, if we're dealing with you know, the Lake States region and, and into, into Manitoba, our severe disturbances are much more frequent, but really the, the point is that we're trying to find out what's the natural bounds of, of, of disturbance and how can our techniques fit into those. As I mentioned before, um, there's certain trade-offs associated with that. Obviously, there's not another access that's internal rate of return or, or how often you need to you know, be getting wood out for, for meeting objectives. But if your goal is to totally emulate natural disturbance, you'd be trying to stay on this side of, of this black line, so within kind of the natural variation that was observed. One thing that, that becomes really apparent as we start looking at kind of historic landscapes um, throughout the country um, and, and throughout North America is that there's been a major shift in a lot of kind of our, the patterns and really the abundance of certain species in the landscape since European settlement, which is often used as kind of our bench, benchmark in terms of assessing you know, where we are relative to historic patterns, um, for whether that's right or wrong. And this, photo, this, this series of maps I think many folks are familiar with already. Um, basically, the one on the left is just showing um, kind of the dis distribution at a pretty coarse scale of the different forest types in the Great Lakes prior to European settlement. What folks should focus in on is this dark green um, throughout here. Basically, um, this dark green is our upland conifer type, so jack pine, red pine, and white pine. And what we see, this, this happens to be a map on the right from, from the late 80s of kind of our modern forests that we see a major reduction in these upland conifer types and an increase in this yellow type, which is aspen. So we've seen a major reduction in um, you know, one, a very important forest type on the landscape scale for, for various reasons, bees, deer, browse, um, you name it, um, lack of seed source. And so from an ecological silviculture standpoint, really our goal is, is to try to actually increase you know, how much of this yellow now would contain more of that upland conifer type. So trying to have that diversity of vegetation types in the landscape scale that we would have had historically. Because you can imagine that certain species within these, these large areas that are now aspen that relied on, on, on pretty big intact areas of upland conifer are, are now either gone or greatly reduced. We just don't have that, that habitat. So using regeneration systems or, or favoring certain species um, in those areas as best you can. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about things that might be working against that. 
the last kind of aspect of ecological civil culture revolves around this concept of biological legacies. And, and that is, um, you know, historically a lot of our focus on civil culture and management was, you know, how much are we harvesting? How frequently are we harvesting? You know, what are we getting back for regeneration after we harvest? And from the standpoint of ecological civil, civil culture, the main focus is not only, you know, how much we're taking and, and, and how frequently we're, we're creating um, harvest entries, but it's also, you know, what are we leaving behind? And really, a, I think one influence that ecological civil culture has had, and, and part of it has been borne out from kind of aesthetic um, preferences of, of folks on the landscape, is that you know, a lot of our site level guidelines, um, you know, dealing with you know, recommended management practices for forest forestry in the, in the lake states and, and beyond, really deal with you know, leaving behind reserve trees or leaf trees or, or trying to retain um, snags and dead wood where possible. So, we certainly are, are, are thinking about leaving behind biological legacies out there. With ecological civil culture, they might argue, you know, someone that really ascribes to this, that, you know, meeting guidelines is one thing, but ecologically there might have been a lot more left behind following a disturbance. And so even if the minimum is 7 to 12 trees per acre as reserve trees after a clear cut um, based on the guidelines, you know, historically we might have seen maybe 20 trees that, that would have survived a, a windstorm or disturbance. And so trying to emulate what those legacies might have, might have been given given your ecological and, and economic goals. One way to think about ecological civil culture that's useful, particularly um, as you think about this in contrast to traditional multiple use sustained yield management, um, you know, it's, it's a major departure from trying to regulate the forest in a, in a, in a way that supplies an even flow of timber. You know, you, you're often managing for a lot, lot more diversity. You're leaving a lot more behind. If you're basing your just harvesting entries on things like you know, how frequently windstorms occur, it's a little bit different than if you're going to base your harvesting entries on you know, what might maximize um, profit or, or, or maximize biological growth out there. And so ecological forestry really should be viewed, or civil culture should be viewed kind of as a, as a three-tiered approach. And one way folks have thought about this, and, and people um, likely have, some have been exposed to this, is, is this concept of the triad. So basically, how do we balance the fact that if we devote a large portion of the landscape to ecological forestry, um, or we can't count on as much area producing, you know, just sustained flow of timber as we would have if we were just harvesting everywhere intensively. And so the way the triad works is it divides the landscape into kind of three main components. First component is, is ecological reserves, and I'll talk about each of these um, specifically in detail in a moment. The second component is the, is the managed matrix, kind of the large um, forested matrix out there where we're, we're practicing varying degrees of ecological um, civil culture. And the final component is, is high-yield plantations or, or, or high-yield civil culture. This concept was first developed in the early 90s, again, um, in the Northeast, but um, certainly uh, Quebec and, and other, other folks are, are starting to embrace this as a way to think about allocating your land base to meet different, different objectives so in terms of ecological systems. And so the one component of the, the triad is ecological reserves. I think um, most folks are familiar with the concept of, of having reserves out there, and I realize many folks on, the, on this uh, webinar are, work for public agencies where, you know, often in many cases you're mandated to leave or set aside areas of high biological value or, or, or set aside, you know, entire parks. Um, in the case of our federal land base, we've set aside things like wilderness areas, but these are basically large, you know, intact, unmanaged areas. And what they're meant to do in the context of ecological civil culture is almost serve as a benchmark condition. That is, if we're trying to maintain native biodiversity within our managed forest, we want to get a sense of, well, well, how much is really out there to begin with if we didn't do anything? And, and kind of use these you know, reserves as kind of an experimental control, for, for lack of a better, better term. That is, we want to know other species that are existing in these reserves that we're not seeing in our managed areas and, and doing other habitat types they need that we can maybe leave behind in our harvest that, that can create that on the landscape. The other function that these reserves serve as is that it's kind of a refugia or kind of or can serve as a source population for certain organisms that just aren't going to do well in, you know, a recent clear cut or, or even a, you know, an area being recently harvested using uneven age management techniques. And so basically they, they can stay in those reserves and, and quickly uh, over time recolonize those harvested areas and, and, and kind of spread that diversity across the landscape. To balance out the fact that we're, you know, leaving a portion of the landscape in reserves and Another part of the, the triad is to actually have kind of a, a similar proportion of the landscape that is actually in you know high yield civil culture, and to kind of put it in a context, you know, this 
this triad approach, again, it came out in the early 90s. And, and at the time, basically, they said this high-yield civil culture would occur on, on just industrial ownerships. But what we've seen, at least in Minnesota, we just completed a recent survey of civil cultural practices. Um, and within literally a 15-year period, um, as a lot of our industrial ownership shifted from being a traditional forest industry ownership to being more of a either real estate investment trusts or, or, or TMOs, a lot of these ownerships no longer can put in those early upfront costs to get you know, vigorously growing plantations going. You know, Pre-commercial thinning, release treatments have become less frequent on these industrial ownerships because it's hard to justify those investments um, to the stockholders in these groups. And so based on the current landscape we have right now, some of this high-yield civil culture is going to need to keep occurring on, on public lands. You know, so picking up the brunt that might be lost from some of these um, industrial ownerships that, that no longer are managing as, tensive, as intensively or, or focus more on things like real estate development. And so you know, using these, these areas to sustain our wood supply needs so that we can do much more ecologically based things in other portions of the landscape. So kind of focusing our management in one, one, one area versus across the landscape. The, the final part of that triad really is where ecological civil culture occurs, right? That, that large managed matrix where I think most of us spend our day you know, doing, doing forest management. And so it can be varying degrees of how much of this ecological civil culture you do. Um, you could go all out and basically you know, manage a forest to try to restore it to old growth structure and never take a piece of wood off of it if, if you have unlimited funds. Or you could at least at the bare minimum you know, do, do certain clear cutting practices where you know, you're still leaving behind some green trees, but in, in actuality most of that harvest is, is going to be fairly commercial and you're just leaving behind some of those legacy elements out there. Basically, this is where the creativity comes in from a civil cultural standpoint, you know, trying to maintain that diversity of, of structures in the landscape while at the same time meeting you know, other economic and operational constraints. And, and so this managed matrix really is where you can vary different levels of ecological civil culture um, depending on you know, what your ownership is as well as depending on, on, on where you are and what, what your objectives may be. So I'm going to shift from ecological civil culture, but before I do that, I just want folks to think a little bit about you know, some of the principles I was talking about as, as I start moving into this carbon and climate change discussion, because some of them are going to be completely consistent with what I say in terms of how we're focusing civil culture for carbon and climate change, and some of them are going to be kind of a, a non-factor. And so ecological civil culture really cares about biodiversity. We're, we're really trying to focus on maintaining biodiversity in the landscape. And so as I go through discussing carbon and climate change, in your own mind is think about, all right, you know, do those practices also provide provisions for that biodiversity objective, because um, there's certainly going to be some, some trade-offs um, that exist. So as I mentioned early in the talk, and I think everybody um, has been getting this uh, kind of beaten into their heads ad nauseum over the past couple of years, um, we, we are viewing our forests as kind of a solution to carbon and climate change, where we're concerned about you know, where our forest might be going, and you know, what species might be migrating, what new insect is going to destroy the forest as we, that we know and love. And so um, I'm going to talk a bit about just kind of the main approaches to um, managing for carbon as well as um, managing for, for climate change. And typically when we thought about carbon and climate change, there's two main ways we view cultural strategies in the context of global change as, as well as um, carbon change. And, and those two different strategies are either our civil cultural or forest management practices that are mitigation strategies. And th by those, I mean those are basically management strategies that increase the ability of a forest to take in CO2 and kind of offset our impact on, on greenhouse gases, or adaptation strategies. Those might be you know, management practices that actually minimize you know, how much that forest might change given you know, changing climate regimes or introduce insects and diseases. So I'm going to talk specifically about each of these um, separately and kind of the, the different differences between them and the different um, approaches folks have been taking relative to those strategies. So mitigation strategies have, good, I think, gotten a lot of the focus. Um, people really are, are pushing hard for um, you know, how do we find ways to increase carbon storage. Here in Minnesota, we're currently trying to find a million new acres of forest to plant to try to minimize our carbon footprint. And so there's, a, there's really a global effort right now to figure out ways, and people are very aware of ways of trying to think of what is my carbon impact? Are there, can I use forests or, or forest management practices to try to you know, offset what I'm doing, or actually maybe even do some sort of management practice that increases the ability of forests to offset um, climate change? And so one of the main things we can do in management is certainly influence sequestration rates. That is, influence how, at what rate forests are taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and incorporating them into their biomass. And so 
basically anything that's related to sequestration rates you know, is related to what makes forests grow quickly. So again, I mentioned before, the packaging has changed, but the tools have remained the same. You know, a lot of our management techniques for enhancing sequestration are, are, are really just how we would manage forests in a fairly intensive manner to get you know, rapid, you know, highly productive stands. So a couple of things, um, certainly all of us being from the northern uh, temperate and boreal region, Thinning and improved growing stock are likely in our toolbox. Fertilization, we, 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 I don't think we really have the, the species or, the, or the, really the, the levels of productivity that to, to get re, the returns we might need to make fertilization viable. But in other parts of the country, we're certainly thinking about fertilizing stands to get them to grow more quickly. Although, um, if you incorporate the, the fossil fuels used to de generate fertilization, um, oftentimes it, it can be less carbon um, positive than, than you think. Another way we can do um, influence sequestration is just to try to find an understock stand, so like this white spruce stand, you know, fill planting to increase the level of stocking. Again, as I mentioned before, here in, in Minnesota and other parts of, of the lake states, and, and the new climate change bill even is advocating you know, planting trees in areas where they currently aren't, so just enhancing the amount of tree cover on the landscape to inc increase sequestration. But one other way I think it's important to think about um, stocking is also what I call stocking from below, so basically going into kind of creating two storage stands, so in our systems going into an aspen stand and maybe underplanting with conifer species or going into some of our uh, more, more mid-tolerant overstories and, and maybe underplanting more shade-tolerant species. So basically stocking as much biomass as you can into an area uh, to, to, to increase the amount of carbon that's being taken out of the, out of the atmosphere. The flip side of sequestration or kind of a, a result of sequestration is just the amount of carbon that's being stored at any point in time in the landscape within that, that growing forest biomass, both, both living and dead. And at this point, the, the general conclusion about carbon storage is that you know, the longer we let forests grow, unless they completely fall apart, but if we have, if we have forests of long-lived species like red pine or, or white pine or um, you know, the northwest Douglas fir, basically the, the longer those forests grow, um, the greater the level of carbon storage is in the landscape. Um, essentially what they see is once you clear cut that stand, it takes a long time to accumulate the same amount of carbon that was in that stand prior to harvest. And so often what we're advocating for in the landscape is to influence carbon storage, we want you know, increased rotation periods on, on the land. Or in, in some cases, what I might even argue for is increased rotation for maybe 20 trees per acre. So you, you might be doing a clear cut with reserves, but leave behind some long-lived trees just to serve as a source of carbon out there and, and really um, meet other ecological and aesthetic goals. Another aspect of carbon storage is that we're trying to minimize how much of that carbon is decomposed um, by um, bacteria and heterotrophic organisms and released to the atmosphere um, as CO2. So we're trying to minimize the amount of respiration that's happening out there in the landscape. And when we look at young forests um, that are growing back after a clear cut, those young forests, the first five, 10 years of their lives are actually a carbon source. They're actually releasing more carbon than they're taking in. And the reason why that's occurring is that after a clear cut, those soils are so warm and you have so much dead material on the ground that, there's, that the respiration rates are releasing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere that those, those trees aren't, you know, just aren't big enough to offset that. And so what we often try to do to minimize the amount of, kind of soil warming we see and in, in, in subsequently respiration rates is, is to use partial harvesting systems. So either a two-age method where over time, you know, like an extended rotation our extended shelterwood method, like here in the, in the mid middle, this happens to be a <clears throat> photo from the Menominee lands, where essentially over time they're, they're gradually removing this overstory. And so at, at any given point in time, you don't have a lot of direct sun hitting the, hitting the, um, the forest, or even through um, you know, leaving reserve trees out there, trying to minimize how much, how much light is actually reaching that, that forest floor. One thing that's really become interesting to, to watch in terms of thinking about carbon storage and, and, and carbon management is that we're getting a much more what I call life cycle view of, of our management. That is, we might be doing a great job in the forest, you know, storing as much carbon as possible, but if the next stop for that log after we harvest it is to be burned as, as bioenergy, essentially all that carbon that we've been storing is now being released to the atmosphere. And so what we're often thinking about from influencing carbon storage is how do we influence the storage in that wood long after it's left the forest? So one way to do that is, again, through good forest management, basically you know, regular thinnings where we are increasing the size and quality of the trees and, and hoping that when it comes, for it comes time for final harvest, we have a lot of larger, high-quality wood that could go into long-lived forest products, whether it be 
um, dimensional lumber or our furniture. We think about biomass harvesting and where that fits into this. Um, if and when the markets become you know, strong enough that we can actually do early thinnings or actually do timber stand improvement harvest, we can, in, a, in effect, be improving the quality of our stands. And so we're, we're getting maybe a carbon neutral energy source from our forest, but we're also increasing the quality of those trees that are left out there, allowing us to increase long-term storage. One thing that also kind of fits into biomass harvesting is when we leave behind slash on these sites, um, basically this is a substrate for a lot of that bacteria to work on and, 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 and emit CO2 to the atmosphere. And so if we can you know, harvest this, these residues off the site, kind of minimize the amount of carbon that's out there for the, those microbes to, to work on, these small pieces of carbon, um, we're also increasing the amount of storage that's out there. So clearly this is not something that was in our civil culture book even 10 years ago in terms of you know, managing forests for carbon storage. But the way we could do it is we find the exact tools to do it. It's just a different mindset um, relative to, to carbon. The last point along that, those lines is that we see a lot of conflicting information or, or conflicting ideals in terms of you know, we want young, vigorously growing forests versus extended rotation forests for carbon storage. Really what's important is that if we're going to have young, fast-growing forests out there and, and then harvest them after 40 years, most of those forest products are not going to go into long-term storage. And so even though we're, 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 we're maybe going to get a, a new, fast-growing stand out there, the products from those stands are not going to be very, um, very long-lived out there um, in, in our consumer market. Likewise, when we get into biofuel harvest, this happens to be a 40-year-old red pine stand, which many might argue was just maybe a little past time for its first thinning, that was clear-cut. And most of this uh, material is being marketed for biofuels. So if we see biofuels start forcing our rotation age to be a lot quicker, um, the ability of these stands to store carbon as well as the ability for those, that carbon to be stored after it leaves the stump um, will go down. And one final component along those lines, you know, I'm advocating for you know, these frequent thinning entries, but we also have to think about, well, how much CO2 is being emitted as, these, as this machinery goes out there every five to 10 years to do those treatments. And so we need to think about this in the larger life cycle context. The last aspect of this climate change um, and, and, and carbon story I'm going to talk about really deals with these adaptation strategies. So I've just discussed the mitigation strategies related to carbon. Now I want to get into, you know, if we accept that the future is uncertain, that is, we know there's going to be a new invasive insect that shows up, you know, in Duluth or, or at some other port, or we know there's a new invasive species coming on the landscape, or that the climate is going to change in 10 years and make it harder to do what we did today with managing a certain species, you know, how do we manage our forests to either allow them to you know, survive or withstand those changes or actually adapt to those changes and still maintain functioning? And so really two key concepts that are involved in the context of adaptation are, are the concepts of resistance and resilience. And resistance is just, you know, as you would imagine, basically the ability of, of, of a system to withstand change and, and, and during that change still maintain some normal functioning. Um, as an example, this is a red pine stand where they did an underburn through this. Um, this stand, even though a disturbance came through it, a, a fire burned, it still maintained its normal functioning in terms of growing wood. But, you know, there, there really may have been a little time lag in productivity, but overall the stand still was a forest functioning just you know, absolutely normally you know, a year down the road after this underburn. If this forest had a tremendous amount of ladder fuels in it and a fire burned through it, and we had a stand replacing fire that, that torched all these red pine and killed them, it would have been, a, you know, would have had very low resistance to that disturbance. So this is a simple example of resistance, you know, in, in a system. Resiliency is a bit different in that we don't necessarily want to maintain. We don't necessarily care if the same species are maintained after a disturbance. What we really care about is that the same functions are maintained. And so we could have, you know, this red pine stand completely burn, but if immediately after that burn we had a bunch of aspen sprout and completely occupy the site and become a vigorously growing forest. We've now returned that system back to kind of that, that normal forest functioning. And so we, we would say that that was highly resilient. And, and Aspen is kind of our, our, our poster child in terms of a resilient species, for, for better or worse, um, one that certainly is able to um, recover from disturbance and, 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 and return to, to normal functioning. So one, we're trying to actually minimize impact. The other, we're trying to make sure that we're able to recover um, fairly rapidly from that, that impact. So in terms of building resistance, a lot of uh, focus has been put on put on um, building resistance, particularly in the context of managing for wildfires. Um, if we start seeing more prolonged drought periods, or seeing more mountain pine beetle outbreaks, or, or other other insect and disease outbreaks, 
we certainly are concerned with the amount of fuels that are out there in the landscape. And, and so one of the, the main tools we often talk about in terms of building resilience to change is using some sort of density management technique, whether it be free commercial or commercial thinning, that is essentially reducing that stand density and either minimizing its conduciveness to a stand replacing disturbance. So we have a you know, example from the Sierra Nevadas where we took a stand. Everybody's seen these, these photos before. You know, high amount of ladder fuels essentially thinned it down that when a fire burns through here, it essentially will be a kind of moderate intensity surface fire versus completely stand replacing ground fire. But beyond fire, we also think a lot about thinning in the context of forest health. Um, certainly many of our insects and diseases, um, we've seen evidence that when we thin stands, they have a much higher level of vigor on the residual trees. Those trees are often able to <clears throat> withstand um, the impacts of you know, defoliators. So, so here in the lake states, we've, we've thinned you know, our spruce plantations in response to spruce budworm. And, and some results suggest that um, those stands that have been thinned have a much um, lower impact than, than those stands that are much denser. Um, likewise, in the west, of these mountain pine beetle outbreaks, those thin stands are, are showing less, um, getting less impact than, than the, the ones that are more dense. And actually, a recent work is showing that thinning is, is minimizing drought stress on trees. So in these stands that have a lower density of trees, um, have higher vigor individuals, the effects of drought seem to be less. And so folks are starting to advocate for if we want to build resistance to future drought periods, we should be making sure our stands are thinned and maintained a, you know, an adequate stocking that each tree has enough resources to withstand um, these changes. Again, common sense, good civil culture um, on the landscape. The other aspect of resistance to change um, goes back to you know, kind of your, in your forest health courses folks took. You know, whether it's agricultural crops or forest crops, when we have a monoculture in a landscape, certainly we have a uniform um, food resource. And so if we have a certain organism that's specifically after that resource, um, we can have much greater, they can have much greater impact. The classic example is southern pine beetle. This is loblolly pine being impacted by southern pine beetle. Basically, there, there's little um, resistance to this um, insect within this landscape. There's no other um, species out there to break up that host. Likewise, we often think about not just having a diversity of species, but also a diversity of age classes. Their younger stands might be higher vigor or might just not be the right structure for that organism to affect. And so having a diversity of young and old stands can build resistance. And I'll show an image in a, in a moment that really illustrates that in action. So here's a, a photo from Colorado. So to kind of transport ourselves from um, rel relatively rolling topography of <clears throat> the upper Midwest to uh, Colorado this morning. It's a photo by a colleague of mine, John Bradford. Um, from the Roosevelt National Forest, which has been impacted by a mountain pine beetle. And so these, these orange crowns or brown crowns here just represent killed lodgepole pine from mountain pine beetle. And what you can see here is we have an you know, older stand, probably 90 to 120 year old, years old. We have a high level of mortality. And then a younger stand is probably you know, anywhere from 50 to 60 years old adjacent to this that, that has zero mortality in it. And then a mixed aspen conifer stand here where you have you know, scattered individuals getting killed but a relatively intact functioning forest nonetheless. And so thinking about resistance, certainly having a diversity of age classes is making this landscape generally more resistant to that outbreak. Um, what will likely occur over time is this stand will get older, and it will get impacted by mountain pine beetle, but this stand will be much younger. Um, and, and so you'll have kind of a, a mosaic of, of stands being impacted over time, suggesting that we should have some diversity of ages out there. Likewise. In this mixed stand, we have kind of species and functional diversity. We have you know, a mixture of aspen and pine so that we don't have a complete wipeout of the landscape. We also have some other conifers like um, Engelmann spruce in the understory. And so this is still functioning like a forest, even though you know, some of these scattered pines are being killed. So this would be, one would argue, this is kind of a resilient patch to the disturbance uh, relative to other, these other portions of the landscape where all the pines are being killed. The final aspect of, of this photo that just shows a way for resistance is we have some structural diversity. So a diversity of sizes of pine and, and, and other conifers out there where it's just a diversity of hosts for that organism and there's just not a uniform food source for that insect to move through. And so anywhere you see kind of these, these differences in size, we have, we have much lower levels of impact. So just kind of an example of resistance in action. And, and so civil culturally, you know, certainly having a diversity of you know, either clear cuts, um, different rotation ages across this landscape and really in, in scheduling our harvest to try to maintain that um, diversity. The last component I'm going to talk about is building resili resilience. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this for, for two reasons. One, 
I, I realize some of you may have already partaken in the webinar that Klaus Putman did on um, building com complex adaptive systems in forests. If you haven't, I'd recommend reading the book, A Critique of Silviculture. It gets into some of these um, concepts of building resiliency in the landscape. But one thing I'm just going to mention is that a lot of these concepts that, that, that argue for you know, resilience, so trying to maintain a landscape that can recover, are really focused on biodiversity and, and trying to maintain a diversity of species in the landscape. And, and, and essentially, the, the reason for that is if we have a lot of different species out there, if the climate does change or if the next insect and disease comes along, the more species we have out there, the higher the likelihood is that we're going to have ones that are resistant or, or that are able to adapt to that change and still maintain functioning. And so ironically, I actually have a, a photo in here from Manitoba. These are um, some, some patch clear cuts in jack pine, um, forestry images, so I, I didn't take it myself. But even in this landscape, this is a, you know they're trying to emulate the patterns of, of fire that would have burned through jack pine through harvesting. And so this, is, this landscape has quite a diversity of, of structure, both these, these islands of trees, which certainly are supporting more interior species, these scattered trees, which, which likely are influencing certain environments. And so this landscape in general is harboring quite a diversity of tree species and, and a diversity of, of other biota. And so if tomorrow you know, a jack pine, um, introduced jack pine beetle or even the mountain pine beetle, which is threatening um, for some folks to move into some of our jack pine systems, reaches this landscape, we're going to have a diversity of, of, of habitat types that hopefully will harbor a new species to come and, and, and replace the niche that, that jack pine um, occupied. But many of the approaches that are talked about in terms of resilience um, are, are often linked to these ecological silviculture principles. One thing that's important to realize, though, when we think about resilience is not just about species. You know, you can have jack pine and, and red pine and, and feel like you have a very diverse stand, but if you think about those two species, they're there are some similarities in, in terms of site types that they like to occupy. Certainly a little bit different in reproductive strategy, but we often want to be trying to maintain a landscape that has a high diversity of functional diversity. That is, you know, a wide range of different species traits so that if we do have a drier climate, we have species out there that we are maintaining that certainly do better under dry conditions versus wet conditions. If there's a new introduced organism, so we think about um, emerald ash borer, many of our black ash swamps, we really are only favoring one species in a lot of those swamps. Um, and so if we had other species we could get growing in those wet conditions, those stands would, would be able to you know, adapt and respond to the loss of ash um, over time, something that really is a challenge right now in the flake states. And so trying to have a diversity of species. Um, this is an example of a, um, the final stage of a shelterwood harvest. On, on, this is from Minnesota, actually, St. Louis County lands, where they were managing primarily for, for white and red pine but what we have here is a mix of, of, of red and white pine as well as aspen, balsam fir. There's actually some spruce mixed in. So thinking just a, of, a, of, a, of a regeneration harvest where, sure, our goal was to try to get back you know, a couple of pine species, but in actuality, we have a pretty high level of functional diversity out here. We have a, you know, a sprouting hardwood species. We have a, a prolific seeding um, conifer species. And so functionally, we have quite a bit of diversity so that if in 10, 10 years that the climate dramatically changes, we have, we have at least a good chance at this point on the landscape that this one of these tree species is going to be able to adapt. Likewise, um, you know, one of the biggest disturbances we have out there in the landscape, even though it doesn't get as much front page news as a, as a blowdown or a windstorm, is just the persistent browsing of a regeneration by deer. It happens to be a red pine being browsed. And basically, if we think about building resistance to things like browse, it's, it's having you know, a mixture of palatability out there. So currently, we're, we're putting a lot of you know, white spruce in the landscape to try to you know, increase how unpalatable our, our stands are. So having a diversity of kind of food types and, and, and mixture of natural and, and artificial region to just increase the level of resistance to that disturbance in the landscape, kind of a, the bane of, I think, most foresters' existence right now um, in, in the Lake States region. So I just want to make a couple of quick comments and, and allow time for, for a question. So I, I might go a little quicker than, than folks might want to this last point. but. It's important to recognize that there's all this kind of new emphasis on climate change or ecological civil culture, and, and, it, and it's important to understand that there's not, not one-size-fit-all solution, just like there never was a one-size-fit-all solution for our, our traditional management. And, and one figure I just want to, to highlight is this is a, a study that was done, this is the United Kingdom, and they looked at kind of regional patterns of biodiversity. and so. Uh, basically, these darker colors down here correspond to high levels of biodiversity, and these lighter colors correspond to low levels of biodiversity. And in the same study, they also looked at carbon. And so these, these darker colors up here represent high carbon, and these lo lighter colors represent low carbon. 
And what you see is there's a major trade-off, right? The areas of the United Kingdom that have high levels of carbon as well as high amount of good, good scotch um, being produced is this, this northern part, you know, Scotland, the, the, the heath. But these are also very low biodiversity areas. And so someone would argue these sites are outstanding for climate change mitigation, but they're terrible for adaptation, right? If, if one of these heath species goes away or, or we start losing that peat, the, the functioning of the system um, goes down. And we could draw the same map, I think, for um, going into Canada and the boreal zone from, from our, our more temperate systems. And so there's definitely trade-offs at these large scales. And what we need to make sure is that when we're managing, we don't kind of go all out just for carbon storage and forget that we we're, we're also want to maintain some level of diversity in these stands to make sure the, these forests can ad adapt. And so your best way to store carbon is just to pack wood on into an area. We could just pack an area with, you know, even age um, single species red pine stands. But if one disease organism hits that stand, we have very little ability to adapt or, or um, be resilient to that, that change. Likewise, another issue um, is you know, this, this context of, of you know, bioenergy and biofuels. Certainly, um, one of the, the positives folks often argue about biofuels is, is creating a market to allow us to do some of these treatments that we couldn't do before. So early thinnings, um, you know, getting rid of slash off of some of these sites to minimize bark beetle outbreaks, um, using, you know, being able to pay for thinnings that might be you know, meeting ecological goals. The problem is that as we start creating markets on these legacies, so you know, a hard snag or a hard log or even just that, that woody material at a younger age now has a market. And so certainly some of those markets for you know, pulling as much as you can off that site to, to get bio, you know, biomass are going to work against some of these earlier principles related to ecological um, civil culture. And, and if we do, in fact, shorten rotations, certainly work against this idea of, of historic range of variability. But one important context, and I'm sure many of you thought of it as I discussed this aspect of historic range of variability, is that kind of our frame of ref reference for a lot of these um, you know, ecological civil culture practices tend to be you know, the, the 1600s and the 1800s. And, and certainly we have, to, we, we have to acknowledge that things have changed tremendously since then, both in terms of um, increases in deer, um, new insects and diseases in the landscape. Clearly, emerald ash borer wasn't buzzing around at that time. And so it's important that we have kind of almost a peer review to think about what should our frame of reference be going forward if, if so many of these things have changed, you know, how can we manage these systems to deal with this, this uncertainty? And, and, and the, my rebuttal of that is really the goal should maybe not be to kind of emulate what happened in the past, but to try to maintain all the players in the landscape the best we can. You know, having that complexity on the landscape will really maximize the resiliency and so ensure that when we do have the next insect that comes out in the landscape or the next large-scale um, drought or fire, we have a diversity of um, species out there to adapt to that. So just to summarize before I, I take uh, your questions, um, really I hope, again, folks didn't um, log on hoping to hear the, you know, the D'Amato shelter with the, the answer to our problems in the 21st century. Really, I think a lot of what we need to be doing to address these new objectives is already in our toolbox. And then really it's, it's more a change of our management approach change and kind of accepting that not everything has to be perfect in kind of our, our traditional mindset, fully stocked stands that are, you know, are a single species. We, we, we really want to be managing for what we call the tails of that distribution, you know, building in um, resiliency in those sites, having a diversity of species, accepting that it's good to have you know, multiple species out there for, for functional standpoint. And kind of a, a closing point along those lines is that I think many of us have always been guided by this principle of, of being sustainable, you know, as foresters and as, as managers and, and, and myself as a researcher, you know, I look and, and, and try to seek ways that we can sustainably harvest and, and leave things in, in, in a better fashion than they, they were when I came, up, came upon them, to sustainably supply things. Well, our traditional view of sustainability did not really think about resiliency, and so not only should we be thinking about, you know, only taking as much as we need, leaving, you know, replanting stands, but we also want to be building into those stands the capacity to change and maintain their functioning so that future generations can also enjoy the benefits we, you know, we, we reap from those. And they might be different species, but they're still, um, you know, still our forests and still um, doing what we, we value and need for our, our livelihoods. I appreciate, um, again, everybody kicking off their week with this uh, webinar, and I'd, I'd like to um, talk about um, you know, a couple of questions. So if questions come up, could you discuss in more detail the potential future markets of biomass harvesting? Well, loggers will support themselves this way. Um, basically, um, I am not an economist, and, and I think many folks know there's been a lot touted about uh, how great biomass harvesting is going to be from an economic standpoint. 
Currently, there is a cost share program called BCAP, it's the Biomass and Crop Assistance Program the USDA um, is currently doing. Um, it's quite a lucrative cost sharing program for loggers. Um, I believe they'll match dollar for dollar um, every um, up to $40 per dry ton, what, what a power company pays for, for the biomass. And so certainly, um, the, uh, there's a way to maybe make carbon uh, biomass harvesting more profitable. But right now, the markets are still pretty poor. At the same token, there's clearly a lot of subsidies and, and momentum there. I don't think it's going away. But, but right now, it's certainly not going to um, be the, 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 the only way a logger can, can support themselves. I think it just needs to be in kind of an added benefit um, at this point. Um, carbon loss from burning biomass, certainly, you know, for, for burning it, the, the, the storage is, is anything that was stored in that carbon is now being released, released to the atmosphere. If we're able to turn that biomass into a biofuel and uh, and use it to, to offset or, or replace uh, fossil fuels, then we get, start seeing some major benefits um, for bioenergy. But right now, currently, um, you know, biomass looks best when compared to things like coal and natural gas. Wind power and things like that, where you're not, where there's really no combustion at all occurring, um, certainly are, are more carbon neutral. But biomass is a step in the right direction, and as technology gets better, uh, we'll certainly have a much lower carbon impact and, and make that much more truly neutral than, than, than it is right now. Okay, thank you, Tony. This is uh, Mike Cranky, and I see someone is typing in a, another question. Uh, just feel free to type in your questions, and uh, we want this to be as interactive as possible, even though we uh, we don't have audio. Uh, we have this opportunity to ask Tony. Tony just received a large grant, as some of you may have seen in the paper, uh, to uh, better research uh, biomass uh, potential. and. Uh, uh, there'll be some really good research here coming up in the future. So keep uh, asking questions as we're waiting. Here we go. Yeah, so prescribed burning in terms of impacting carbon storage, it's actually an, it's a, a good question. Um, you know, the burns itself initially um, may, you know, combust and, and release some carbon. But in a, if you look at it in the perspective, if you use prescribed burning, to kind of restore a surface fire regime and actually reduce the, the likelihood of a future standard replacing fire. Um, prescribed burning in that regard actually is, is uh, enhancing carbon storage potential because you're, you're reducing the amount of fuel on a site, which, which in turn is reducing the likelihood that all that carbon stored in the large trees will disappear. There's also been some recent research that shows that um, what they call biochar, so basically a biomass that gets consumed by fires, um, lasts a lot longer on, on the landscape. I think we all um, realize that based on the charcoal we find out in the site, that actually burning sometimes will enhance the ability um, to store carbon because um, it actually makes this wood much less um, likely to break down. And so it, as, a, as a prescribed burning actually can be a, a positive as long as um, it doesn't develop into a Los Alamos um, circumstance, which I, I think everybody recognizes was an extreme. But the goal is to minimize how much of that carbon goes up into the atmosphere. And so we can use prescribed burning to, to just maintain surface fires and, and, and keep the development of ladder fuels, which would lead to a huge loss of carbon in the atmosphere. Um, excellent. It fits in really well with, with carbon storage. I guess, you know, along those lines as well, if you're using it to prepare the site for regeneration um, in, in the long run, um, also is, is, is minimizing, you know, it might allow you to develop an understory of regeneration beneath that. Um, Beneath that stand. So, question about the biomass grant. Oh, Mike, you really got on off topic. Uh, what new ground are you going to cover in the grant? Uh, basically, the, the you know a lot of this is going to deal with some of the biodiversity questions, um, as well as uh, look at kind of a life cycle analysis of you know how sustainable is biomass harvesting from a carbon standpoint, given you know transportation distances we need to haul the haul the materials. We'll also be doing kind of a an economic analysis. You know, what is the distance that uh, what is the price that Biomass has to be worth to be shipped a given distance. Um, currently, right now, it's it's you know as everybody knows, it's heavy. It's not worth that much, and so you have to have a plant pretty close by to make it worthwhile. But but a large portion of the grant will be kind of revisiting some of these carbon and, and nutrient cycling questions, as well as um, looking at impacts on regeneration, understory diversity. Um, there's some folks that that look more at fungi and um, microbes, things that clearly I'm not 
trained to do. But um, so we'll be looking at, at, at some of those questions as well as a, a regional analysis of, of kind of the availability and sustainability of um, biomass harvesting really across um, the lake states as well as um, into Canada if we can get some data from, from Ontario. And I'd be happy to... Yep. And I'd be happy to send, um, if you want to give me an email, I can send them a kind of a summary, of the, like a one-page summary if they're curious as to what we'll be doing. I'd be happy to send that out to the participants if you'd like to send that to me. Sure. Okay, that'd be good. I appreciate your time and uh, excellent teaching here today, Tony. Uh, I think we've spent the hour uh, uh, listening and, and learning. and uh, So I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, we have a few questions we would like to ask participants. We have about 30 people online. I'd like you to click on your um, answers to the questions. And this is sort of a poll to determine uh, other uh, webinar potentials in the future. We've hosted six webinars now. So the, uh, how you uh, view webinars and if you'd like us to continue them. Uh, and. Do you happen to have other topics as well? Just feel free to send them to me by email or call uh, call me in there. So, uh, you begin to enter in, which is very good. Okay. I'll also mention that uh, January 12th, we're having a White Pine Symposium with Kerry Pike is helping organize that with the Minnesota Tree Improvement Cooperative here at the Cloquet Forestry Center. So. Keep that in mind. It's an all-day symposium on white pine, January 12th. We're looking at February 23rd uh, for the seventh annual research review. That will also be here at the Cloquet Forestry Center. So we're still pin, pinning down that day, but it looks like it's going to be Tuesday, February 23rd. So uh, we have a whole slate of new programs coming up, which will be out on our website very soon. So uh, keep track. And uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, seeing you in person and also on. Looks like uh, we have uh, a high interest to attend other webinars. Oh, you did very good. Um, more excellent. Okay, for uh, using webinars, and most of you would like about four to six year, um, you would recommend them. OK, well, that's good. Uh, for the grant uh, from the uh, University of Minnesota Northeast Sustainable Development Partnerships, uh, we have to do an evaluation. So this will help us in the reporting. So once again, Tony, thank you very much again for your time and your excellent webinar. And we look forward to uh, visiting with you more in the future and look forward to uh, more webinars in the future. So we'll close this off and thanks again.